Hey everyone, Chris Earle here again with another GEOG 217 lecture. Today's lecture is on immigration. So when we moved all of our classes online, there was an expectation that we would take the remaining four weeks of material we had and compress it down into two weeks. So today's lecture is actually 1B. This is the second part of the first lecture. The first part, 1A, was indigenous communities. So if you haven't watched that one yet, please go back and watch it first. Today I'm going to be providing a bit of context about immigration in Canada in particular, specifically how immigration patterns have changed over time and how immigrants now come to find themselves mainly in urban areas. And then my esteemed colleague, Nick Perron, will take over. and He'll provide some really important context from the Global South. In general, today we're going to be discussing immigration and how patterns of immigration have shaped and have formed the urban landscape. Similarly, we're going to look at how urban spaces have come to shape the experiences and livelihoods of immigrants. It's incredibly important for us to remind ourselves that, especially here in Canada and throughout North and South America, the urban centers we've built have been built by, for, and because of immigrants. Immigration is one of the most natural things that we as humans do. From the earliest points in human history, we've been moving around to find better opportunities, safer places for our families, and to find places that will allow us to reach our full human potential. So in that sense, urbanization and immigration have gone together quite naturally. As long as there have been urban centers, humans have been trying to move to them or move close enough to them so that they can benefit from the economic opportunities, social influences, and the political power that come from cities. Canadian cities in particular have been fundamentally shaped and influenced by immigrants. Over time, people have come from every corner of the world to share in the opportunities and the promise of Canada. For over a hundred years, those immigrants have predominantly settled in urban areas. And in doing so, they've shaped the neighborhoods in which they live, the business areas that they establish themselves in, and the cultural lives of the urban spaces they come to call home. There are notable challenges and issues that have arisen in response to immigration, and the opportunities that immigrants have sought haven't always been easy to access. It is around all of this, the promise of a new home, the potential in the urban environment, and the struggles that come along with migration that the story of the modern city has been written. From the earliest moments of Canada's colonial history, immigrants have been shaping and reshaping the country's landscape, in particular through how they established settlements. For much of Canada's early history, immigrants came from predominantly England and France. And as time moved along, more and more immigrants began coming from mainly other places in Europe. One can see this in the names of the places that they founded throughout Canada. Nova Scotia, for example, is the Latin form of New Scotland. The original name of Toronto was York which is named for the northern English city. And Kitchener, in Ontario, was the main area of settlement for a large German population. So, up until the First World War, it was called Berlin or New Berlin. Cities across North America can trace their etymological roots to the names given to them by immigrants, keen to start anew, but also keen to carry with them a piece of their home. During the first waves of immigration, those coming to Canada would establish cities and towns that helped them best facilitate trade and transportation. These were mainly based on the methods of transportation that were available to them at the time. And this is why a considerable number of Canadian cities that were founded pre-Confederation were founded near or directly on waterways, as water-based transportation was the easiest way for Canadians to get goods to market. In eastern Canada, a significant number of the largest cities were placed directly on the water in the earliest days of development. These are cities like Halifax, St. John's, Quebec City, Montreal, Kingston, Toronto, Hamilton, Windsor, Victoria, and Vancouver are the western cases. Immigrants would either settle in these cities or settle near enough to them so they could get access to them with some speed. As Canada was, if you'll remember, mainly a rural dominion at the time, many of these immigrants settled on farms that would be close to these large cities, because these large cities acted as 
transportation hubs. As technology changed, the railroad became an important part of Canada's transportation infrastructure. The places that immigrants were then encouraged to settle, and the patterns of settlement, were very different because of that. Suddenly, places that were away from large rivers, lakes, and oceans became more accessible and more desirable. In particular, the farmland around these new transportation corridors was becoming incredibly appealing. See, for a significant period of time after Confederation, up until about the dawn of the 20th century, immigrants were purposefully and strategically encouraged to settle in rural areas as opposed to moving into cities. This is in large part because the Canadian government had a problem on its hands. After Confederation in 1867, British Columbia was quickly brought into the Canadian Federation in 1871. But aside from a postage stamp size of land that would eventually become the larger province of Manitoba, mainly around what is Winnipeg today, which was in itself causing problems for the Canadian government at the time, there was a vast swath of land between two distinct parts of this newly formed country. The Canadian government believed that only through populating this land with white European settlers could they lay claim to it. See, the land was already inhabited by countless indigenous communities, but the Canadian government wanted to dissuade the United States of America from enthusiastically expanding into this territory. Early Canadian government officials were grappling with a belief in the United States. It was a political and social belief that we call the theory of manifest destiny. There's some debate as to who actually came up with this theory, but it's generally considered to either be the writer Jane Casneau or the newspaper editor and politician John O'Sullivan. This is mainly around the time of the Mexican-American War in the 1840s. The general theory behind Manifest Destiny was that it was white Americans with their propensity for Republican values and their adherence to democracy and the enterprising spirit that they had that would redeem the failings of Europe, which they saw as an old world. And only could they do this by conquering and settling the entirety of what they saw as the New World, North and South America. In reality, Manifest Destiny was a racially motivated and exclusionary political philosophy that was predominantly used to justify American wars of imperialism and the subjugation of primarily black, brown, and indigenous peoples in the lands that the United States would eventually conquer. It was a philosophy that began to grow in prominence, and worryingly for Canadian officials, it became politically appealing to individuals in the nascent Democratic Party. So Canadian politicians were faced with leaders south of the border whose values and rhetoric seemed to indicate that the occupation of the space between British Columbia and the rest of Canada was a real threat. So to tackle this problem, they, interestingly enough, adopted an American policy as their own. In 1872, the Canadian government initiated what was called the Dominion Lands Act. The specifics of this act were pretty simple. The Canadian government enthusiastically went to people in Europe and said, hey, come, settle in Canada. Settle in this land between this tiny little bit of Manitoba and British Columbia, and we will give you 65 hectares, it's about 180, 160 acres, so long as you build a house and you can farm just 25% of that land. Hell, you can even take some of that land and after a while, maybe even sell it off. You gotta hold on to the land for a bit, but if you act now, all this could be yours, absolutely free. All you need to do is pay a $10 administration fee, and soon you'll be farming in the territory that they call the Northwest Territories. The Canadian government worked hard to encourage settlement in what was still the Northwest Territories at the time by sending out pamphlets with testimony from farmers, from settlers that had actually occupied this land and included glowing quotes about the land, such as a quote from a farmer that said, rye does well in this country. I have been in Scotland, England, the United States, and Ontario, but this country beats them all. So a farmer named Robert Bell, interestingly from a community called Burnside. Another quote was, having only had two years experience here, I cannot do justice to this country as I would like to do, for I believe it to be a good country, 
I was nine years in Ontario and in Ireland up until manhood, and I prefer this country before either of them, taking advantage of everything. That was from Edward Johnson from a community called Springfield. In large part, these testimonies focused on how lucrative and appealing life was as a small farmer compared to either life in the big, dirty industrial cities of Europe at the time, or in the growing Canadian cities that acted as transportation hubs. Tactics like this worked really well, with vast numbers of new immigrants moving into what was then still the Northwest Territories. As this was occurring, the Canadian government realized there was incredible economic potential in strategically encouraging immigrants to settle in rural areas as opposed to cities. The Canadian government realized that the agricultural efforts of these immigrants could be incredibly lucrative. So when the government of Wilfrid Laurier took over, they changed the program a bit and they shifted to a different marketing strategy. The lands being offered up were suddenly called the Last Best West. A massive marketing campaign saw pamphlets like this one offered up throughout Europe and the United States, highlighting the amount of land for sale, the quality of the soil, and the specifics of how easy the program was to sign on to. The campaign painted lands in Canada's West as the last place for people to settle and make a life for themselves, free from the problems of Europe, the lawlessness of the United States, and the worries they had at home. The point of both of these programs was to get people moving to Canada as quickly as possible and establishing themselves to prevent American incursions and to connect the divided parts of the country. The strategy worked and by 1905, the Canadian government saw fit to carve out two provinces from the Northwest Territories, which would become Alberta and Saskatchewan. They also filled in considerable portions of Manitoba to create roughly the same size that it has now. All this is occurring during what we call the third wave of Canadian immigration. This is approximately from the beginning of the Dominion Lands Act to the end of World War I. There was a slowdown during the Great Depression, but after World War II, the Canadian government began to aggressively court new immigrants, and this would be called the third wave of immigration to Canada. During the third and fourth waves, the overwhelming majority of immigrants came either from the British Isles, mainland Europe, or from Scandinavia. But as you'll note, taking a look at this graph, a significant number of individuals came from East Asia. In particular, these were individuals coming from China. This is something we've discussed in the class before, particularly with regard to how organized labor in a concerted effort tried to marginalize and isolate individuals from China who were trying to secure jobs and opportunities. A significant number of the stories around immigration from Confederation up until the 1970s and 80s are the stories of Europeans and how they mainly settled in rural areas and then eventually after the Second World War moved into urban areas. But East Asian immigrants were very different. Again, particularly those from China settled mainly in large urban areas from the beginning. This is in distinct contrast to how white Europeans were treated when they moved to Canada. See, Chinese immigrants faced incredible discrimination and alienation tactics that seriously impeded their ability to work and find the same opportunities as European settlers. This discrimination would be manifested in the urban landscape in a very unique way. One theory holds that, thanks to discrimination, racism, and social isolation, individuals coming from China were pushed into urban areas and through the resilience and the strength of their community created what would become one of the most ubiquitous and culturally specific neighborhoods in urban areas. And these, of course, would be Chinatowns. Writing in 1987, the critical geographer Kay Anderson quoted from a royal commission that occurred in Vancouver in 1902. This royal commission was focused on Vancouver's Chinatown and was underpinned by the characteristically discriminatory beliefs that white settlers had with regard to their Chinese compatriots at the time. Anderson writes, again, quoting from the Royal Commission, They come from southern China, with customs, habits, and modes of life, fixed and unalterable, resulting from an ancient and effable civilization. They form, upon their arrival, a community within a community, separate and apart, a foreign substance, within but not of our body politic, with no love for our laws and institutions, of people that cannot assimilate and become an integral part of our race and nation. End quote. Anderson takes a different approach when considering Chinatowns, though. 
See, Anderson asserts that Chinatowns weren't simply created because of discrimination and socialization. Instead, Anderson considers Chinatown to be a racial category by itself. It's rather than simply a neighborhood, a material embodiment of the racial ideologies maintained by colonial authorities at the time. See, Anderson uses post-colonial theories, specifically those developed by one of the great post-colonial theorists, Edward Said. Said developed a theory around what he called Orientalism. This asserted that depictions and beliefs surrounding the East, which is generally considered to be parts of North Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, were directly tied to Western conceptualizations of how the West was different and somehow superior to other cultures in the world. Said would specifically tie Western depictions of the East to imperialist tendencies of Western European powers. Anderson elaborates upon that by discussing Chinatowns in much the same way. Europeans would use what are called imaginative geographies that would further entrench differences between different groups of individuals underpinned by racist ideologies and moralizing standards. Anderson would discuss how Chinatowns weren't just seen as places of settlement for those immigrating from China, but also seen as centers of vice and debauchery in urban areas. Considering the time period in which many Chinatowns were established, Anderson notes that the social Darwinistic philosophies surrounding race that tied things like culture, intelligence, and morals to one's identity, to one's physical characteristics, these had a profound impact on how white settlers viewed Chinatowns. If you'll remember to the lecture on forming identity in the urban environment that scholars such as Prashansky asserted that the identity that we develop in urban areas isn't simply based on our interactions with those places, but is also developed based on how we interpret the beliefs that other individuals have around those places. The way that we see the city and the way that we place ourselves in the city is impacted just as much by the city form itself as it is by how people tell us the city is supposed to be. Along those same lines, individuals in the late 1800s and early 1900s had specific beliefs around Chinatowns. There were assertions that Chinatown was the place where you could go to find sex workers, buy drugs, drink, gamble, engage in any kind of illicit behavior. White settlers began to place themselves as the other to those living in those areas. Anderson asserts that Chinatowns are actually very Western urban landscape types. Westerners had developed racial categories, assigned values and morals to those categories, and then discriminated based on those categories. Chinatown was that discrimination made manifest in the urban landscape. Anderson notes that, during the 1890s, Vancouver City Council actually designated special bylaw and public health officials to Chinatown listing it as an area of concern. At the same time, the city deemed it unnecessary to provide the same services that it did to white settler areas of Vancouver. They didn't pave the alleys or provide adequate garbage collection. The situation became so bad that in 1906, one particular company in Chinatown was fed up with how poorly the city had been managing garbage collection and actually applied for a license to just do it themselves. At the core of Anderson's argument is that people settled in areas seeking community. Racism and discriminatory beliefs resulted in white settlers designating the area as one of vice and sin based on their flawed racial ideologies. They pulled back on providing services, leaving businesses and residents to take care of themselves. The worsening situation meant that some illegal businesses began to operate. The city would then see those illegal businesses operating as validating their preconceived notions and their earlier beliefs. That validation would result in them pulling further and further away from providing services. This would go on as a cycle. While immigrants from China were some of the most visible non-European settlers in Canadian cities at the time, especially during the first waves of immigration, they would be joined by an increasing number of diverse immigrants over time. For the purposes of our class, we're considering urban areas, 
So we want to know how immigration has shaped, changed, and formed urban areas over time. And to give you an idea as to how significant this impact really is, we can look at the number of recent immigrants, namely those who have immigrated from 2011 to 2016, and where they've chosen to settle in Canada. Taking a look at this graph, we can see that a significant majority, in this case 73.3% of individuals who recently immigrated to Canada, have opted to settle in large metropolitan areas. These are metropolitan areas with a population of over 1 million. In the case of Canada, that's Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, and Ottawa. The remaining areas then make up 9% each. And these are the medium-sized cities, the small-sized metro areas, and then all other places in Canada. But for reference, we have to consider how densely compacted these places are. There are only five medium-sized metro areas in Canada, and they took in 9% of immigrants. The next 24 small-sized metro areas also took in 9%. And then every other place in Canada took in another 9%. All this goes to show that the settlement patterns of immigrants are highly skewed toward urban areas. Why might this be the case? Well, when Statistics Canada looked at the settlement patterns of particular immigrant communities in 2017, they found some very interesting characteristics among different groups. Looking at just Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, researchers noted that while immigrants from the British Isles, the US, France, and Germany were fairly evenly distributed throughout each of these cities, immigrants from the Philippines, India, Bangladesh, Ghana, and Iran were incredibly concentrated in how they settled. Part of the reason for this might be that individuals coming from countries with different religious, cultural, linguistic, and social backgrounds may come more readily to rely on individuals who can speak their language, understand their faith, or familiar with their daily practices. Indeed, 63% of immigrants in urban centers said that over half of their close friends came from their particular cultural community. 70% reported relying on their close neighbors for support, and 7.7% reported belonging to a social organization that was dedicated to their cultural community. This is in large part because dense urban areas are where the neighborhood characteristics can best facilitate social integration. Arriving in a new country can be challenging, scary, and overwhelming. So, to have as much comfort, support, and familiarity as humanly possible while still seeking out new opportunities is incredibly important. Urban neighborhoods can more easily facilitate the links between people that can make these things possible. There are four identifiable ways in which the urban environment can facilitate immigration into an immigrant's new home country. These are personal networks, relationships with neighbors, engagement with urban life, and an overall sense of belonging to a place. Personal networks are easier to build in urban environments than elsewhere, for the simple reason that there's a stronger likelihood you'll be able to find and interact with people who share your background if there are more people in your community. The same StatsCan study that I referenced notes that 65% of individuals living in a majority immigrant neighborhood identified having three or more very close friends in their social network. 46% of those in highly concentrated ethnic communities noted that they had at least three family members with whom they felt close and on whom they could rely. These close relationships can help ease a person into a new environment and are crucial to an immigrant's first few years in Canada. Urban environments because of their large, dense populations, offer more chances to meet, connect with, and come to rely on those who know what you're going through. When large groups of immigrants cluster together in urban areas, they can come to rely on their neighbors. Having trust in one's neighbor is crucial for those coming to a new place and trying to understand new ways of living and being. 53% of those living in neighborhoods where over 70% of the population had an immigrant background noted that they had a high degree of trust in their neighbors. What's interesting, though, is that immigrant neighborhoods in Canada aren't usually comprised of people with the exact same ethnic background. Though they may form the plurality in a neighborhood, usually these neighborhoods are incredibly diverse by themselves.
So it would appear that the shared experience of simply immigrating was the uniting characteristic here. Urban areas also offer the opportunity to become involved in the civic life of your new home while maintaining connections to your background. This is where participation in culturally oriented social and political groups comes in. See, becoming involved with an organization that brings you into contact with other people who share your experiences is important. These groups can hold events, parties, advocacy campaigns, fundraisers, and election events that can help bridge the divides between the place you came from and the place you now call home. And this can, of course, help one's sense of belonging in the urban environment. There's evidence that when an individual moves to Canada, they maintain a strong connection to their cultural and, culture and identity, but they fully adopt the Canadian spirit. 94% of immigrants note having a very strong connection to Canada, and 86% have a very strong connection to the urban area that they call home. While having those key social and personal networks is crucial to helping individuals get started in Canada, often new immigrants come to fully blend those cultures and develop a new sense of identity based on their experiences. The urban environment thus serves as a safety net, helping to catch people as they fall into a new country. Of interesting note though, is that people who are born to immigrant parents are actually more likely than their parents to identify with people of their culture. Showing a sense of comfort and ease in a new setting while also seeking to forge an independent and unique identity. Again, this is made possible by the denseness of the urban environment. So, what have we discussed so far? Well, we've looked at how cities were originally settled based on the transportation methods that were available to Canadians. And, as technology advanced and things like the railroad became crucial parts of Canada's transportation infrastructure, cities started to move further and further inland. This was matched by the Canadian government's desire to steer immigrants to western and rural areas to dissuade the United States from claiming what is now Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Many of these immigrants were from Europe, settling in rural areas, but a significant number of individuals from China settled in urban areas during the third and fourth waves of immigration. In contrast to how Europeans were treated at the time, Chinese immigrants that settled in Canada's cities faced incredible discrimination. The concept of Chinatown was developed either out of community and necessity or as a by a desire from white settlers to differentiate themselves from those immigrating from China, depending on the two, which of the two theories you subscribe to. More recent waves of immigration have seen newcomers settle in larger cities, and these cities have helped facilitate integration into Canadian society through the strength of personal networks, immigrants' relationships with neighbors, their engagement with urban life, and how urban areas help develop a sense of place. This helps immigrants stay connected to their culture, adopt Canadian cultures, and forge a new hybrid identity from that. But now, my esteemed colleague Nick Parlock. Nick is an incredible scholar uh, with ample experience both studying and living in numerous places around the world. He'll be able to give a unique and distinct perspective specifically focused on the situation of migrants in the global south. So take it away, Nick. Hi everyone, my name is Nick Parent. I'm a cultural geographer and PhD student at the Department of Geography, McGill University. So today I'm going to give a lecture titled Social Cultural Hierarchies, States of Exception, and Liminality. So I'll be drawing on some examples from migration in the Global South and kind of building on to some of the migration-focused themes that you've been looking at um, through Geog 217 cities in the modern world. There are three objectives to this lecture. So to show how migration phenomena engages with persisting social cultural hierarchies, to explore the nexus between migrant spaces and states of exception, and finally, to identify interlinkages between the politics of migration and the experience of migrants. Okay, along the way, I'll be sort of uh, stopping the video to give you some time to think about some specific questions. Okay, so I'll give you what's called think stops. So I encourage you to pause the video and just take a moment to read those questions and kind of reflect on it because it's going to allow you to uh, 
bring that content into maybe some of your, uh, your, your own personal experiences or experiences that you have sort of heard through other people or other testimonials that you've kind of, or, or things that you've experienced in your life, basically. Okay? So, um, just a little bit about myself. So, I'm a migration researcher, mostly, uh, and have been doing it for several years now. I lived in Turkey for four and a half years, and during that time, I uh, did a lot of research on the Turkish perception of Syrian refugees. At the same time, I worked a lot with civil society organizations, uh, with Syrian refugees, as long, uh, along with Iraqis and Afghans and um, different, mostly Middle Eastern uh, refugees in Turkey. Uh, after that, I moved to Peru for two and a half years, and while I was there, I was also doing some migration research through the Universidad del Pacifico in Lima, where we looked mostly at the policy responses uh, regionally of the Venezuelan exodus. And uh, sort of since then, I've worked on some migration cases uh, here in, uh, or some migration research issues here in Canada, um, about the Balkans, and my current PhD um, work is on Congolese refugees in Rwanda. So, moving on from that, uh, we'll be looking at three main themes uh, in this lecture, okay, as the title of the lecture suggests. So let's start with social cultural hierarchies. So when we think of hierarchy, we think of it as a sort of pyramidal structure, right? Um, and it's basically a model to help us understand how power is distributed across different persons and groups throughout a society. Now, in some cases, this sort of pyramidal structure or, or this social organization is determined by the cultural, the ethnic, and the sort of racial criteria in that society. So when that's the case, we can refer to this as social cultural hierarchy, okay? And sometimes it happens that in a, in a nation, for example, or in a community, there are different social cultural hierarchies that operate in parallel, okay? Um, now, in recent cases of, of countries that have experienced large inflows of migration, so for example, Brazil, Hungary, or Thailand, we've seen that perceptions towards migrants are sort of aligned with these pre-existing social cultural hierarchies, okay? So let's look at two independent cases. In the first case, we have religiosity of Syrian refugees and Turkish rich perception. So the migrant group here, they are Syrians, they're families, they're religious, they're conservative, and they're ethnically Arab. Okay, and then the host groups, so those are basically the groups, the different groups in Turkey. Okay, and this is obviously generalized here. Um, we have supporters of the current president, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, okay, which he is obviously representative of his party, which is AK Parti. Then we have Republicans and what we would call White Turks, which are essentially Turks that have a sort of certain... Uh, friendliness or or interest in the Euro the, the the European liberal values, let's say, okay, and they are mostly uh, those that will vote for the second party in line, which is the JHP. Um, then we have obviously the large Kurdish population um, and the nationalists. Now we can see here that um, from the research uh, that I conducted while I was in Turkey. What I found time and time again was that those that were Republicans and the White Turks were the ones that had the highest risk perception towards Syrians. Now, why? Well, we have to go back to the demographics of that migrant group, right? So that group is religious, they're conservative, they're Arabs, right? And so for a Turk that is a Republican, this is essentially large or important threat factors, let's say. So. Um, we see here that in this sort of cultural organization of the society, that will determine in some way or another the risk perception towards migrants. Now, let's look at a second case, okay? Um, so, the changing whiteness profile of Venezuelan migrants in Peru, okay? So, in the first case, we're really looking at a sort of, uh, a sort of static, almost, I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to call it necessarily static, but... Um, 
you know, throughout the, the migration of Syrians, this has remained quite constant. Whereas in the second case here, we see that there's a dynamism that happens on the ground. So in the first and second wave of Venezuelans entering Peru, so between 2014 and mid-2017, the migrant group was uh, single, ethnically white, um, you know, had a little bit more, more, more money, they were urban, they were professionals, and they were educated, right? And the host groups in Peru, well, basically there are European des descendants, there's mestizos, which is sort of um, those that are European descendants that intermarried with local population, um, of course, starting through the, the time of colonization up to now, okay? There are serranos, which are uh, essentially uh, indigenous Peruvians that, that live in the mountains. And then there's, of course, the indigenous group, or what they consider as the indigenous group, which are those that come from uh, they, um, uh, from the, 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 the jungle rather than the mountains. There are Afro-Peruvians and there are Chinese Peruvians. So in this first wave, what we kind of saw in discourse was that the Serranos, the Indinas, and the Afro-Peruanos were the ones that had the highest risk perception. And the reason for that was that they knew that as Venezuelans would come in, they would be mostly taking up their jobs in mostly Lima, okay? Because Peru is a highly centralized country, so a large percentage of the population lives in the city of Lima. And those that work mostly in the service industry um, uh, are, 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 are those that are Serranos, Indinas, or Afro-Peruvians, okay? So they were kind of, they saw this, this, this inflow as quite threatening because they all, oh no, these people are going to take our work. Whereas those of European descendants and more the mestizos or the Chinese Peruvians, which are, 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 are you know, are more on, uh, in the higher rankings of society, let's say in terms of socioeconomics, um, they were actually welcoming this. Um, and you tie then, th then this into uh, historical ties with Venezuela, where during the 1990s, uh, when there was a civil war uh, going on in Peru, most of, or uh, not necessarily most, but a, a good number of, of upper class Peruvians actually went to Venezuela. So during this first and second wave, there's a sort of solidarity with the white Venezuelan, okay? The educated, the professional Venezuelan, okay? But then in the third wave, so between mid-2017 and until now, you saw the demographics of Venezuelans changing quite a lot. So you had families, more ethnic diversity, uh, more indigenous persons, and or or, or, or Afro-Venezuelans, uh, Caribbean, rural laborers, lower education level, and then at this point, those groups that at first were actually quite welcoming to Venezuelans, uh, the the European descendants and the mestizos, for example, they actually start to become more and more fearful because. Now, those same groups that they, that they see within their own society, that they're afraid in their own society, right? Because there is definitely, uh, it, Peru is an extremely classist uh, society. And, and, and so having this third wave of Venezuelans that would sort of prop up these other groups now in Peru, they ended up seeing this as a threat. So you end up having during this third wave almost uh, blanket xenophobia across the country uh, towards Venezuelans, okay? So this is just to show how these different uh, socio-cultural groups within a society can actually change uh, the perception of, of migrants. Let's do a think stop. Does Canada have social-cultural hierarchies despite its diversity and cosmopolitanism? If so, do certain groups seem more risk-averse to immigration than others? To expand on this, maybe you can ask yourself, are there certain ethnic or cultural groups that face more xenophobia in Canada than others? And could this be tied to some of those social cultural hierarchies that we have here? Okay, let's move on to the next uh, theme, which is the state of exception. Okay, so a state of exception is essentially a space where typical laws, rules, and protocols are suspended as a result of the unique or special character of that space or situation. Okay, so it's basically, a, a, oftentimes it's a delimited geographic space, and even sometimes it's, it's time limited, where it'll be, for this moment, we're going to have a special situation where basically 
uh, we can essentially act beyond the law, okay? So in states of exception, government or other power entities can act above or beyond the law, where their actions are justified by out of the ordinary circumstances, okay? So some examples of states of exception are things like ghettos, right? So you have some uh, poor neighborhoods, for instance, um, oftentimes which are, which are closely aligned with um, ethnically uh, marginalized neighborhoods as well, right? Where, um, for example, police or security forces can go in there and do things that they would probably not be able to do in other neighborhoods, right? Because there's less oversight. Um, and also there are certain conditions that allow them to do things um, that they might not be able to do somewhere else. Like for example, there is a threat of gun violence or there is a threat of um, drug use or something like this, right? Now, um, sometimes these are uh, evidence driven and sometimes these are discourse driven, right? And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Another state of exception uh, can be refugee camps, okay, which are out at the margins, um, they're away from cities, so they're also away from uh, the eyes of, of the regular citizen, um, and also they, um, they end up hosting non-citizens, right, that may, um, that may be subject to certain, um, certain behaviors or certain controls that go that go beyond constitutional rights of citizens. Uh, and then there's areas under a state of emergency, okay? Um, and then I just thought about giving a, a, a more specific and targeted example, which is Guantanamo Bay, uh, where of course, you know, the average person knows very little about what goes on there. And this would be probably a very good example of a state of exception where, where really, um, the, the, the governing and powerful entities that operate within Guantanamo Bay um, has a lot of flexibility and can sort of uh, work extrajudicially, um, you know, if necessary. The concept of state of exception was advanced by an Italian philosopher, Giorgio Agamben, um, which he starts by referring to the concentration camp in World War II. So here he says, the camp as the pure, absolute, and impassable biopolitical space. Now what he's referring to here, of course, is biopolitics, which is an idea advanced by Michel Foucault, which is the state's ability to control uh, bodies, okay, will appear as the hidden paradigm of the political space of modernity whose metamorphoses and disguises we will have to learn to recognize. So what he's advancing in this, in this quote here is the idea that the concentration camp as we knew it during the Holocaust was sort of the birthplace to what we now understand as the state of exception, okay? Which are basically spaces where governments can really exert their power over people's bodies. Okay, and are, are, are sort of absent from following rules or laws or protocols as we saw um, in the previous slide, right? So all of those sort of mechanisms that regulate and, and hold certain authorities accountable are suspended, um, either temporarily or for a long period of time. So in the context of, of migration, states of exception um, are actually quite common. Okay, so we see an increased number of detention, migrant detention, mostly irregular migrants that either enter or leave a country uh, irregularly or informally. So without maybe the proper documentation or crossing a border um, without following, a, without going through a checkpoint, for instance. And what we see is that when apprehended, these migrants, um, sometimes refugees, sometimes, sometimes forced migrants or, or refugees, and sometimes not, such as economic migrants, um, become detained. Now, um, the concept of detention obviously is as a form of incarceration, of imprisonment, and in those spaces, as we know, the state has absolute control over the, the bodies of, of whoever's in there. Uh, when we talk about migrant detention, it becomes a little bit fuzzier because oftentimes these migrants, uh, people don't necessarily know that they're in a detention facility. 
um, so they won't necessarily have uh, access to, to lawyers or people that can protect their rights um, or, or sort of track their, their case to see how, how things evolve um, throughout, their, throughout the time and see if the detention will be, be shortened or lifted or um, if they will be granted um, the ability to, for example, seek asylum. Um, another example can be that of neighborhood raids. So there are neighborhoods all across the world, and this is uh, the, the the standard rather than the exception, that oftentimes migrants um, kind of pick a neighborhood and sort of start building that neighborhood together, okay? And it's this idea of, um, of cultural solidarity, right? So you're in a new country, and a sort of neighborhood ends up sort of being built or there is a, a large immigration of, of, of a certain nationality, for example, or ethnic group. And so you have a neighborhood that really uh, kind of thrives in that way. Um, now, of course, here in, in, in Montreal, for instance, we have these um, ethnic enclaves, right? So we have Little Italy or Petit Maghreb, for example, right? Um, now, um, in the Global South, oftentimes these neighborhoods that migrants, uh, and especially forced migrants, end up in are usually lower income neighborhoods. And so police will oftentimes raid these neighborhoods, um, sometimes, for, um, sometimes for credible reasons, and sometimes for, for reasons that are unclear, that are maybe more political or discourse oriented. So in these neighborhood raids, um, Basically, the, the, the police authorities or, or, or the, 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 the power entities that enter these neighborhoods, um, it's very unclear what rules they are following in terms of respecting people's rights, respecting people's privacy. Um, are they, for example, um, arresting people as a result of probable cause or because of racial profiling? So this is another example of a state of exception in these migrant neighborhoods um, where, where, there, where there can be some frequent raids. Um, and then the last, of course, which is the, the, probably the, 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 the closest link to the state of exception in terms of, of, of um, not metaphorically, but you know, materially, is the, the, the concept of encampment. Right, so there are many refugee camps uh, across the world. Uh, here there are three, so there's Atari camp, uh, the Dab camp, and Gihembe camp. And these are obviously spaces that are away from urban centers, um, that sort of enclose people. And, and although there, there can be quite a lot of independence and autonomy within these camps, and, and you see that refugees uh, oftentimes uh, exert that kind of independence and autonomy and creativity in these spaces. Uh, these do remain oftentimes very controlled spaces. Um, and, and some camps, some refugee camps are open, so that means that they can leave the camps, but some of them are um, unfortunately closed. And that does, that does sort of liken those encampment situations to um, incarceration, for instance, right? So in these spaces, it's unclear what the government mandate is sometimes, uh, and sometimes there may be some things that, that, that happen in there uh, that are spearheaded by, by state authorities that uh, do not necessarily respect uh, the rights of refugees or, again, um, the constitution of, of the citizens of that country, for example. Let's do another think stop. Other than those mentioned in the examples provided, under what circumstances can cities or parts of cities undergo a state of exception? So for this question, you can think of something that is related to migration, but feel free to go beyond that. Now let's move to the third and final theme of this lecture, liminality. Liminality is an anthropological concept that denotes a state of being between two periods or positions in life, initially developed by Arnold van Gennep, but further expanded by Victor Turner. It's considered to be an important part of rituals and rites of passage. Okay? In the process of migration, though, the concept of liminality has often been used to describe the in-betweenness, the suspension, and the sort of rootlessness that some migrants might feel when traveling and arriving to a new country.
Now, it hasn't been without any criticism, and I think rightly so. There are lots of anthropo anthropologists out there that have actually criticized the concept of liminality because it separates the biological to the biographical of refugees. In any case, it is still a useful concept to conceptualize the experience of migration and how it engages with politics. Let's look at a short quote by Victor Turner from The Ritual Process, Structure and Antistructure. Liminal entities are neither here nor there. They are betwixt and between the positions assigned and arrayed by law, custom, convention, and ceremonial. As such, their ambiguous and indeterminate attributes are expressed by a rich variety of symbols in the many societies that ritualize social and cultural transitions. Essentially, what we can get from this is that liminality is being in transition, a state of flux, a state of change from one thing to the next. Uh, I'd like to link this to the politics of immigration because I think that there's a connection between the politics of immigration and the likelihood of people feeling in a liminal space as migrants. So here we have a political spectrum, or a political pendulum rather, where on one side we have this open borders philosophy like the Schengen Zone for example, or regional integration, pro-immigration, integration programs, uh, public awareness campaigns to reduce xenophobia, a right to employment, encouraging family re reunification, providing things like shelter, humanitarian relief, education, this kind of thing. And then on the other side of the political pendulum, we have sort of closed borders, externalization of borders, uh, the removal and retracting on certain rights that are given to migrants, like the right to seek asylum or employment, access to healthcare and education, criminalization of immigrants, and if we link back to the state of exception, containment policies, right? Now, we see that in the last two or three decades that there's been slower and slow erosion of the uh, open borders, let's say, part of the political pendulum on immigration, right? So there's less and less governments that are pro-immigration, essentially. Um, and this has some implications in terms of liminal spaces and the, the liminal um, liminality uh, of, of, of immigrants, right? Because if you have a country that provides the right kind of support and the right to employment and the right to, to basically be uh, a fully functioning person that is, is welcomed within the new country, there are stronger chances that you'll feel in place and that you won't be in a liminal space where you really, you're, you know, there's no doubt that there will be a transition part of that, but there may be some structural conditions that are in place where people can deal with, for example, past trauma that they've experienced in their home country or throughout the journey of migration. Whereas in countries where there is stricter regulations on, on, on immigration or stricter um, enforcement or criminalization, like on the other side of the pendulum, it may extend periods of liminality for immigrants because they might not be able to work, for example. And if you can't work, you might have uh, financial stress, for instance, right? So um, what we see is, 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 is through time where there are fewer uh, and fewer policies that are supporting immigration, um, society is in a way ritualizing um, immigration as a liminal experience where going through the hardship of coming to a new country actually becomes part of the ritual process of immigration. Um, but fundamentally, I think it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting way to explore how the political pendulum really has an impact, direct impact, on how immigrants feel directly. And now, these are things that we can experience in the global south, which have um, maybe more fluid policy environments where things can change from one day, one week to the next, but this is equally important in global north scenarios. I'd like to continue with one last think stop which is, have you ever moved from one city to another? Have you ever felt in a liminal space? How did power and politics facilitate or hinder your transition? 
And that's it for the lecture. So I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, please, if you want some more information on this, you can you can email me, no problem, uh, or you can visit my website or see the updates that I post through Twitter. Thank you very much. All right, so that was Nick Perron. I hope you enjoyed his guest lecture here. And I hope all of this has been informative and has shown the different ways that the urban environment has been impacted by immigration and how the urban environment can impact the lives of immigrants. So this is the end of lecture 1B. See you next time for lecture 2, Policing and Deviance in the Modern City. This is Chris Earl, signing off. Have a good one.